So our, our next speaker is actually going to be Chelsea Roth. Uh, Chelsea is the founder and director of Eat, Breathe, and Thrive, which is a nonprofit organization that prevents and helps individuals overcome disordered eating and negative body image. Uh, Chelsea has spent the past seven years pioneering integrative health programs for people with a mental health challenge. And prior to her work in mental health advocacy, Chelsea worked as a researcher in a psychoneuroimmunology laboratory. Uh, her research explored how stress affects mental, emotional, and social health, and how mind-body practices like yoga can improve the outcome of chronic immune diseases. Uh, today, Chelsea is going to be talking about uh, how nonprofits are businesses too, and why should they depend on donations. So please join me in welcoming Chelsea. Hi. Great to see you all. Uh, so, Alec, as Alex said, my name is Chelsea. I'm the founder and director of a nonprofit organization called Eat, Breathe, Thrive. Our mission in the world is to prevent and help individuals fully overcome food and body image challenges. And we do that in hospitals, we do it in community settings, and we do it in schools and colleges as well. Uh, but what I'm here to talk to you about today is if you care about a nonprofit, if you run a nonprofit, if you're getting into the nonprofit sector in any capacity, my hope is to convince you that you should probably reconsider the donation based model and most ideas about what nonprofits are and what charities are to begin with. Um, so I'm going to start with a statement. Raising money is miserable. If you work in the nonprofit sector, this probably echoes true for you. Asking people for money and asking for donations uh, is a thankless and tireless job, and it often creates a lot of wasted time and misery for those of us who work in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and I personally learned this the hard way. You should just do a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, these, were the <laughs> these were the words spoken to me uh, by my boss some years ago as she tried to convince me to quit my job and start a nonprofit organization. Yes, my boss, and not exactly the person you would expect to ask you to quit your job. Um, but she was a mentor and she was a friend, and this advice in particular uh, changed the course of my life in a really positive way. Uh, I was 23 at the time. I had just finished my degree in neuroscience, and I had an amazing job. I was working as a science journalist and as an editor for the Chopra family's online media company, so Deepak Chopra and his daughter. Uh, and it was a really cool job. I loved it. Um, I loved my job, but on the side, I did my passion, uh, which was working with people with eating disorders. I struggled with an eating disorder in my youth, uh, and Giving back to a community that had saved my life brought me an immense amount of joy and meaning, but I didn't need it to be my full-time job. I loved doing it on the side. I had this little integrative health program I was running in a treatment center in California, uh, and life was good. But at the time of this conversation with my boss, Sanjay Gupta had just come out and done a profiling story on, uh, on my nonprofit, uh, well, wasn't a nonprofit, I'm sorry. Sanjay Gupta had just come out and done a story on the program I was running and put it on CNN. And so all of a sudden, this little baby project I was doing as a volunteer for free on the side uh, was getting a ton of attention, and I was getting training requests and program requests from Wisconsin and Ohio, which is not somewhere I wanted to move and start running a program there, uh, and Florida. And I was sitting with my boss and saying, I either have to take some time off and reduce my hours or, or find someone else to run these programs. I don't know what to do, and I was, I was seeking advice. And her advice to me was to take a pause and capitalize on the momentum that was, that was happening right then and start a nonprofit and maybe quit my job as well. So um, I thought about it, and I thought, how am I going to do that? I'm not a millionaire. I have to make money from this. Nobody makes money in the nonprofit sector. And she said, yeah, you can do this. Just do a crowdfunding campaign, raise some money, create a business model, and do it. So being the ambitious young 20-something I was, I thought, all right, I'm going to do it. Put in my notice. I, I figured that raising money would be full-time work, and I launched a crowdfunding campaign. And my goal again, young, ambitious 20-something, was to raise $50,000 in 50 days. 
Uh, so that's, that's the uh, Indiegogo page I created. I did it the quote right way. Uh, I reached out to all my media contacts. I reached out to all my friends and my colleagues. I scheduled little events like birthday party events and stuff at Whole Foods. And for the first several weeks of the campaign, things were going really well. Uh, like most nonprofit fundraising campaigns, I had the initial momentum. People donated. They got behind a cause they cared about. But 45 days in the campaign, Time was running out. Uh, I had five days left in the campaign and I'd raised $16,000, which is a lot of money, but it is not enough money to do an evidence-based study on a program, which is what I wanted to do. It wasn't enough money to go to 10 treatment centers around the world, which is what I had committed to doing to my funders. And it was probably gonna get me through about three months of running this, quote, nonprofit organization. So I knew, I was laying in bed, and I had, again, five days left in a campaign to raise $34,000. And I'm laying in bed and I'm going, oh my gosh, everyone I know and love has donated. They've donated as much as they can. I am gonna fail at this, and I hate failing. I do not like to lose. And I don't like to do things that I say I'm you know, gonna do and not be able to fulfill them. So I thought, what, do I, what should I do? I'm gonna have to expand my audience, and I'm going to have to create some type of urgency that's not there right now, because people are sick of asking me, uh, hearing me ask for money. So I can't show you this video uh, it, with sound, uh, but this is a video, um, let's see if I can put it into words. I decided to climb up on a roof and lay a yoga mat down and not get off the yoga mat until the rest of the money was raised. That, that was, I thought, maybe I'll do a hunger strike, oh no, I probably shouldn't do a hunger strike, I'm doing work with people with eating disorders. And I thought, okay, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll do a yoga strike. Um, and I, I reached out to this uh, really cool little company that had a big mural that said, you are beautiful. It was right when Occupy Wall Street was happening, so I said, hey, can I occupy your mural, occupy you are beautiful, kind of in alignment with the eating disorder stuff. And then I got on a roof and I laid the mat down and I had AV equipment set up so that I could live stream it 24 hours a day online. And then I asked all of my friends and colleagues who were uh, musicians and authors and yoga teachers to come up on the roof and talk about the things that they were passionate about and talk about why eating disorders were an issue that they cared about. And they came up on the roof and because they're self-promoters, they told their friends that they were up on a roof with a crazy girl who was doing a rooftop yoga strike uh, and they shared it with their friends. And in five days, I raised $51,000, which is uh, quite remarkable, and I'm happy to, I did it, but, oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I'm going to send that applause out to all the people who donated. Um, these are some pictures of the people on the roof with me. It was really fun. Got those little blow-up guys that, like, wave in the wind. Um, that was super fun. That was the, the moment I got to come down from this roof. I literally ate up there, drank water up there, had a privacy curtain so I could go to the bathroom in Tupperware containers. I was very happy to come down from the roof. And this experience taught me three things. One, it's that donations and grants are unreliable. Um, it can't rely on people giving out of the generosity of their heart because it's fo it, it depends on um, their ability to give. Uh, grants, I, when I worked in the, in the neuroscience sector, I learned really quickly that a, political, a new political administration coming in would change the availability of money for certain research topics, so you can't rely on grants. I also learned that fundraising distracts from the mission. Um, I, I would have been much better off not on a roof and in a treatment center offering the program rather than being up on this roof, you know, having people come up. And I, it, was, it was necessary for that time, but it did distract from my mission. And then I also learned, and I learned this later on, that monetary gifts have strings attached. And for those of you who work in the nonprofit sector, you've probably found this out with foundations and with corporations who want to grant you money. They often have their own uh, reasons for doing so. So I, I figured, I got done with it, got down from the roof, had the money raised, and I said, I am never, ever doing that again. <laughs> um, my back was sore, and I had enough money to kickstart the organization, but I knew I was going to have to find another model, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So let's start with definitions. What is a nonprofit? There are so many myths out there about what a nonprofit is. A nonprofit is a business organization that serves a public purpose. And those are the key words. That's what a nonprofit is. It serves a public purpose. And thus, it enjoys, uh, it, it enjoys or um, has different tax rules. It, it gets special treatment under the law because it's serving a public purpose. Um, nonprofits can actually make a profit. Uh, 
done a whole lot of reading of the IRS t tax code, many nonprofits make a, pro uh, a profit. Uh, the difference is when a nonprofit makes a profit, they reinvest invest it in the mission and the purpose instead of giving it to shareholders. So it's a very different model. Okay, big number here. 1,571,056 nonprofits in the nonprofit sector. So this is a really big part of, of, of our national economy. Um, also want to note here at the bottom, they account for 9.2% of wages and income. So when we're talking about the nonprofit sector, we're talking about something that means something. It has a massive uh, impact on our economy. Another surprising number I want to point you to 79% of the $1.4 trillion in revenue comes from services and products. So this is in the nonprofit sector. $1.4 trillion in revenue in the nonprofit sector. To, big numbers confuse my brain. To, give, to put that number in perspective, if you were to spend $1 million every day from the day Jesus was born to today, you would not have reached $1.4 trillion. That's a lot of money. Think about that. If you were to spend $1 million every day since Jesus was born, you would still not be at $1.4 trillion. So it's a massive, uh, a massive amount of money moving through the nonprofit sector. I also want to point out, though, 2.25% of registers not, registered nonprofits account for that revenue. So we're not talking every nonprofit you know is, is rolling in, in dough. It's a very small number of nonprofits that are moving that money through the sector. Okay, so what is that money? Where does it, where does it come from? Earned income is a really imp important word for you to know if you work in the nonprofit sector. Earned income is money generated from the sale of goods, services rendered, or work performed. Okay, so we're going to come back to this in a little bit. I want to give you a classic example because sometimes it's hard to take these numbers and put them in, perspe in perspective. Girl Scouts earn $700 million in revenue each year from their Girl Scout cookie program. Perfect example of earned income. Uh, so Girl Scouts, uh, the mission of, of Girl Scouts, I'm going to go here so I can get the wording right, is to build girls uh, of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. So all of that money, that $700 million they make, um, they, they, they it's not taxed because it's part of their mission. It's considered earned income. Uh, having girls sell Girl Scout cookies, at least the way that they frame it, they say this helps girls build job skills, build courage, build resilience, and makes them better co contributing members of society. Uh, if that money wasn't related to their mission, it would be taxed. Uh, but they say it's related to their mission, so they can, they can, uh, they can enjoy those tax benefits. Another really great example. 6.6 .6 billion, this is a massive number. The YMCA is a nonprofit. Uh, it has a really interesting mission too, we'll get there in a second. But that's the annual, annual revenue from the YMCA which operates uh, two, uh, two and a half thousand fitness clubs with over 20 million members. Uh, there's actually a whole movement in the fitness community uh, suggesting that the YMCA uh, creates unfair uh, competition for other businesses because they're so massive in the sector and they bring in so much money. And their rates, I, I looked them up, their, their rates for, their, for the YMCA memberships are pretty comparable to say Gold's Gym or, or any other fitness and health club. Uh, but that money is not taxed. Why? Because the Y's mission is to put Christian principles into practice through programs that build a healthy spirit, mind, and body for all. And that money is considered con uh, a part of their mission. So again, if the earned income is related to the mission, it's not taxed. If it's not related to the mission, it is. Okay, so when does this model work for nonprofits? One, it only works if you have a product or a service related to your mission to sell. Two, it only works if your clients can pay. I was just in Greece working at refugee camps and volunteering out there, and I couldn't quite wrap my mind around how an earned income model would work for some of these nonprofits. Uh, there wasn't, they might have had a product or service to offer, but their clients didn't have money to pay. Um, three, it needs to align with your mission. And some of the examples I gave you, you can make an argument that maybe it doesn't so much align with the mission, but if we're talking ethically about running a nonprofit on an earned income model, the product or service that you're selling needs to align with your mission. It needs to further your mission and per further that public good. 
Okay, so the advantages. Why is this better than sitting on a roof for five days begging people to donate money so you don't have to pee in Tupperware containers anymore? Uh, one, sustainability. Uh, that $50,000, we moved through it in about two years. Uh, but with an earned income model, um, I can, I can create sustainability not just for my, myself, but for my staff and for my facilitators who run our programs. Uh, every day it comes down to, can I pay my staff a livable wage? And with an earned income model, I can. And there's no reason that, by, that because you're doing good, you shouldn't make a livable wage. Uh, I think the, the notion that because you're a nonprofit, you shouldn't be able to pay yourself is completely ridiculous. We should be paying people doing good in the world more. Uh, the idea that it's okay to make $3 billion as a CEO of a company not doing good in the world, uh, but it's not okay for a, a, someone making a nonprofit, running a nonprofit to make $100,000 a year is pretty ludicrous, if you ask me. Um, the other advantage is freedom. Uh, so unlike grants, earned income is unrestricted. Uh, so we do have one foundation that grants us money every year, and they're wonderful, uh, but a lot of grants come with restrictions. So things like, oh, we don't want you putting that money toward overhead, or oh, we only want this money going toward uh, these types of individuals that you're serving. So the nice thing about earned income is it creates uh, freedom within the organization to use that money as it's needed, and it also creates an opportunity for nonprofits to take more risks in the programs that they're offering and to try new things uh, that maybe someone who's granting money might say, ah, oh, yeah, I'd rather you put my money toward this or that. There are disadvantages, though. Uh, one, you've got to be really careful, not just about the regulations, but about your own ethical framework in, in using this model. So earned income within a nonprofit should be substantially related to uh, the mission. I would argue that a lot of nonprofits kind of make this a little bit too flexible, and you can get, there have been a lot of arguments with the IRS about whether the earned income is, uh, is substantially related or not, um, but, but you can make this work. It's just important to be aware that there are regulations, and if you're going to ask that your revenue not be taxed, that it needs to be substantially related to the public good. Uh, the other cost, uh, the other challenge to be aware of is costs. So when you're, any time that you're, you're, you're offering a product or a service or good, there are going to be costs of doing business, which means you've got to have staff uh, that can be uh, helping and supporting with customer service. So that person calling up and saying, hey, I've got your good, but I need help with this or that. Uh, You've also got to market it, which, which requires some staff as well. I never, ever thought in my work I would be doing marketing, but it's, it's part of the, the work we do for sure. So there are costs of doing business. Um, so let me give you, just really practically, how would you put this, how would you put this principle into action? Uh, so my nonprofit, Eat, Breathe, Thrive, our mission is to prevent and help individuals fully overcome food and body image challenges. So we work with men and women, we work with people who have anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder. We also work with girls and boys in schools who are maybe having body image challenges or disrupted relationships with food. We're trying to help those, uh, trying to make sure that those eating disorders never take root to begin with. So this is our mission. How do we earn income related to that mission and create sustainability for the organization? Um, be really transparent with you. Here's where our money comes from. This is, this is literally taken from my budget report from last year. 69% of, of, of our budget comes from earned income, from the sale of uh, services and programs and trainings mostly. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about what that looks like. Uh, a very tiny sliver, like 0.5% comes from corporations because I find when corporations want to give me money, they also want to do marketing campaigns and all of those strings become very clear as soon as you shine light on it. So we, we don't currently take much money from corporations. Uh, foundations. I do have one private family foundation who we've been working with for years uh, who grants us money every year. But every year when I do my budget, I'm conscious of the fact that at any time something could happen with that family foundation that would make that money go away. So I try to make sure that the organization could operate without it. If they decide, hey, we're going to move to a different type of, of uh, funding model now or we, we're more interested in, in uh, funding food initiatives than eating disorder issues, I want to make sure that I'm not completely depending on that 25%. So I try to keep it at 25% or less. And then finally, we get about 5% of our budget comes from unsolicited donations. So I made a vow I'm never asking my friends or colleagues for money again. But if the end of the year comes and they're doing their taxes and they want to donate to somebody, we'll certainly take their money. <laughs> uh, so that's 5%. Okay, so how do we earn income? Where does that 69%, how does it break down? We have programs, trainings, and materials. Uh, 
this really should look like trainings being the biggest circle, programs being a smaller circle, and materials being a tiny, tiny little circle. I'm not a big person on paper materials and stuff, uh, but trainings make up the bulk of where we get our money. Okay, so trainings. Here's our model. Oh, it's a little cut off there at the bottom. So uh, I run about a training a month. Um, we've got a six-week curriculum that facilitators all around the world, even in Italy and Scotland, uh, can offer in their own communities. And to learn to offer that curriculum, facilitators come to a training. Uh, for the initial part of the training, they do pay for their training. Uh, we offer sliding scale rates, but they pay for a four-day training about $300 for a training, which is about the going rate for a professional training of this kind. So that creates a good amount of income. Uh, that actually pays my salary every month, and th I run those trainings. Um, so I do that about once, once a month, but that brings in a healthy amount of, or of money into the organization and, of course, relates to our missions because we're giving people the information and the curriculum and the skills they need to offer programs uh, to people in their own community. Next, we've got programs. So once a facilitator gets trained, this is, this is my favorite part of our entire business model. Um, in clinical and college settings, institutions pay for the trainings. Uh, so um, there's a reason for that. Uh, I wish I could go into it completely in this, in this presentation, but eating disorder treatment is a money-making machine. Uh, most treatment centers ca uh, charge about 1000 sometimes up to $2,000 a day for eating disorder treatment. Uh, I've, I've, I've gotten to know the deep, dark underbelly of eating disorder treatment centers, and they are making a killing off of uh, mental illness. So when we're in clinical settings, you better believe we're going to charge the treatment centers some money for bringing a nonprofit program in. And they've got money to pay. They, they, you know, they're making thirty to $60,000 a month per head on each person in that, in that center. So yes, we do charge for our trainings. Uh-oh. Um, same thing with colleges and universities. Generally, they have money to pay, and I don't want to be charging uh, college students for programs. I don't want to be charging people who are paying thirty to sixty thousand dollars a month for treatment uh, for programs. Uh, in community settings, however, uh, we do charge participants, and we use a portion of that money to pay our facilitators, and then a portion to cover the costs of ongoing support, uh, materials, all that good stuff. So, uh, when someone gets done with our training, the first program they offer, we don't charge for the second part of their training. Training. They're actually going to lead their first program. Um, they charge participants about $300 for a six-week program. Uh, $100 from each registration pays for their training, and $200 per registration goes to pay the facilitators. So on average, our facilitators make between $1,000 and $3,000 for each six-week program they make, they, they offer. Um, that's a lot. That's a really good pay for facilitators. It creates sustainability for them and for the organization. Last but not least, we've got some online trainings. We have a facilitator manual. Uh, we don't make very much from this at all, uh, but, it, but it definitely is, a, is an opportunity for us to keep bringing money uh, each month into the organization. Okay, so rack, wrapping up, um, money picked uh, in the nonprofit sector makes people get a little angsty, and they might see something like this and go, "But is that really a nonprofit? Is that really a nonprofit?" And I, I asked that of my mentor uh, during the first year of running my organization. I said, "There's so much talk about business plans and budgets. I don't feel like I'm actually doing a nonprofit anymore. I feel bad. Should I really be charging people for our programs? I've always gone into treatment centers and not charged treatment centers and off." and offer this for free, I feel bad asking them for money. And what he told me is he said, Chelsea, a nonprofit is a business with a different purpose. And the word he actually used was an in intention. A nonprofit is a business with a different intention. And thus, they operate under different tax rules. When we have a surplus at the end of the year, we reinvest it in our staff, we reinvest it in our programs, we reinvest it in our materials. We don't give it to shareholders. That is a nonprofit. It's a, it's a business with different intentions. And for me, that's the biggest distinction. So in sum, why earned income is not miserable. <laughs> One, it's efficient. I am furthering my mission every time I offer a program and a training and I'm bringing money into the organization I can use to pay my staff. Two, it fosters independence. If that foundation goes away, if grants aren't available, if the Trump administration decides they want to stop offering grants to help with integrative health programs, uh, I, I can still keep going. And finally, it's sustainable. Um, in sum, I want, to, I want to leave you with a thought. Um, 
the thought is, as change makers and as activists and as social justice advocates, it's important that you know the rules of the game. I'm not saying the rules of the game in terms of capitalism are necessarily just or right, but if you're gonna operate from within this machine, you should know the same rules of the game that the YMCA and Girl Scouts and Harvard University and Kaiser Health operate. This allows you to do better in the world. Know the rules of the game if you're gonna work from within the system. Questions? Yes. Hi, I'm an attorney, and I just, I didn't hear you say anything about the, the, I know a lot of people that have nonprofits, and they run them like they're personal businesses, and they don't actually comply with the IRS laws. And as long as the IRS ignores them, that's fine and dandy. But there are certain things like you have to have a board, you have to have board meetings, and the board manages the money, and like, it's, it's not just a business. There's, there's other legal considerations. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm so glad you pointed that out. I'm going to repeat your statement. She's a lawyer and she said many nonprofits operate like their own personal business and they don't abide by the rules of a 501c3 organization. So for instance, boards and uh, regular board meetings. Uh, for that reason, we operate under an incubator organization. So when I had that money raised, I said, there is no way I'm doing by th this by myself. And I went into a larger nonprofit organization and I said, you have a board, you've been doing this for 10 years, can you help us get started? Uh, I think you're, you're exactly right. And as long as the IRS doesn't look, it's not a big deal. Uh, and they should, they absolutely should. So running a, a, a nonprofit, not only are there different uh, income rules, there are also rules ab about the operation of the business. So you may not be beholden to investors, but you are beholden to board members who can fire you at any time. And that's an important part of the nonprofit sector. Yeah, thank you. Yes, other questions? Yes. You uh, were talking about uh, your clients and your clients seem to have money or, or you know, what do you do when your clients don't, don't have, 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 have money? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so uh, many of our clients don't have enough money. So community pro our community programs are offered at sliding scale rates. And one of the, the benefits of running an organization this way is when people come to me and want to grant me money like that foundation, what I can say is I've got enough money to cover my operating expenses. But what I can do with your money is I can go into Watts, a school district in LA, and I can offer no charge programs to people who can't afford it. So for me, when grants and donations come, and this is just the way my operation, uh, my, my in organization operates. Uh, when money comes in unsolicited, I can offer those programs to people in need and in at-risk communities. So this, this model has freed up enough uh, money in the organization that when donations come through, my staff is already paid. And so any money we have, we can go into at-risk um, communities. I, I hope I'm, I'm answering your question. Uh, basically, this is why this organization runs this way, is so that we can offer programs at no charge to people who can't afford it. We charge the people who can pay, we don't charge the people who can't pay. Uh, recently, I found out about an organization that does eating disorder uh, treatment at uh, UCSD, mm. and I was amazed at how much they were charging. Can you tell me a little bit more? I guess it's not unusual. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about this industry? Uh, sure. He, he asked about the eating disorder treatment industry. Uh, <laughs> again, I was offering programs for free at treatment centers for many years because I just figured everyone does this work out of, out of love and out of you know, heart. No one would be making a profit on other people's suffering. Um, generally, eating disorder treatment center, if it's at a residential or inpatient level, uh, minimum cost you're looking at is between $1,000 and $2,000 a day. A portion of that goes to the treatment center. A portion of that goes to health insurance companies. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of different factors involved. Uh, oftentimes, treatment centers are employing um, uh, students who are in the late stages of graduate school. So they're not necessarily paying their staff $200 an hour or anything like that. Um, and not all, not all treatment centers are, are for profit. There are many nonprofit treatment centers, and, and I, I think that's an important part. But what you're really asking about is our larger healthcare system in the United States, of which eating disorder treatment is just one part. And while there are many problems with the for, pro for profit medical institution model here, I also run programs in Scotland and in the UK where state funded Medicare has all kinds of issues as well. Um, 
The other fun factoid, and I'm happy to talk to you about this afterwards, is that there's about just about two conglomerates that run every eating disorder treatment center in the United States. And that was a very uh, <laughs> disturbing fact that I learned that I, I realized that all these different treatment centers operating under different names were, were run by two, two very large companies uh, that didn't necessarily specialize in the treatment of mental health issues. Uh, don't want to say these are just bad guys, but it is important to, to, to know the facts before you get into any industry you're working in as a nonprofit. And on that note, I am out of time. I'm happy to stand around for questions. Thank you for your time and for, for your attention.